Watch is currently on second name to United Nations Sustainable Development Network as Vice President of Education and Director of the SDG Academy. He remains a full professor of International Development Studies, Director of the University College Dublin Centre for Sustainable Development Studies and a Director of the University College Dublin Masters of Science in Sustainable Development in partnership with the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network. He received a PhD in economics from the London School of Economics in 1994. He is a government of Ireland, Maria Curie, IZA, RSA, EIIR, and Ripoir Fellow. He has extensive experience providing excellent services for the United Nations, European Commissions, and World Bank. Among other journals, he has published in the Review of Economics and Statistics, Economic Journal, Journal of Industrial Economics, Energy Economics, and Electoral Studies. His current research is on many aspects of the United Nations 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda, including partnerships, data, technology, science policy interface, finance, and education. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to have Professor Walsh on this year's World Sustainability Conference. Thank you, uh, Professor Walsh, for honoring an invitation, and I welcome you to your session. Thank you. Um, delighted to be here, and thanks very much for the, uh, the to be working with. I'm delighted to be working with the Green Institute and um, at this World Sustainability Conference. And I was saying that I very much enjoyed Professor Inran's speech uh, or his, his lecture. And of course, what I want to talk about are education. The, the link there, of course, is that um, when you're doing this type of reporting, uh, one has to have sustainability office, officers and staff who are capable of actually implementing SDG reporting. So professional training and upskilling of staff is really a big issue uh, for this project or for the sustainable development project. Um, so I'm just going to share some reflections on sustainable development education. Hopefully I can get my presentation going. Um, sorry for the delay here. So hopefully everyone can see this. Um, so I'm on succumbent to uh, the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. Um, and I'm actually the vice president for education and working as director for the SDG Academy. Um, if you're interested in the work we do, which I'll explain briefly in a second, obviously you can take a, um, a photo of the code there and you can download our annual report and you will see all the activities you will do and all our contact details, etc. cetera. Um, Sustainable Development Solutions Network, if you're interested in what that is, if you go to the website, um, what we have, we have uh, Professor Jeffrey Sachs, who's our president, uh, full professor in Columbia University, and John Tate, who's uh, the chair of the board, who's in Monash University. And they actually wrote a little blog on 10 years of SDSN. Um, so you'll get a, a feel for the origins of SDSN and the sort of work that we've been doing. And even though there's been massive achievements um, throughout the network, um, and, and all the things we do, there's just, as we all know, there's so much more to do uh, in terms of creating a, a future we want. Um, but let's, let's have a look at. So sustainable development education. Um, the, just before I go on to sustainable development education, just to say in our role, um, obviously we're focusing on open educational resources. Um, so one of the things we've done from the beginning at SDSN uh, was to create these um, online courses and the majority are up on edX. Um, this is the online platform that was created by MIT and Harvard. And you can see all these wonderful courses uh, that you can do for free. Um, and uh, uh, I'd encourage you to have a look at them. The one that did extremely well recently that was actually trending on edX. So just to show you, there is a mind there is a, a mind shift happening across government corporates and universities and NGOs on trying to learn or get knowledge for sustainable development because this course, the Nature Based Solutions course by the UNEP, the UN Environmental Programme with other partners, was actually trending in edX. So, you know, uh, 
there's lots of like STEM type courses on edX, but to have a sustainability course, is, it's reflecting a change in the times uh, that people are now aware of the problem and they want to fix the problem. And the first step to fixing the problem is to acquire knowledge and to train and upskill. And that's why sustainable ed education is becoming so important. Um, so one step you can take if you want across any walk of life, um, uh, you can do one of our professional certificates. This is just an introduction in a sense, or the foundations of sustainable development doing Jeffrey Sachs's Age of Sustainable Development and Rockstrom's Planetary Frontiers. That's wrapped around into a certificate. And that's a good primer for everyone to know the Paris Agreement and the SDGs and the science and the policy and the practice behind that. Um, so I'd encourage people to have a, a go at that, uh, getting certified by the Academy as a primer. Um, we also have done a bit of work for uh, governments, uh, just kind of the basics for people in public administration. Um, and we are starting, we have at the moment two online masters in partnership with SDG Academy, one in University College Dublin and one in Sunway, but we are um, going to try and get one in the Middle East, not try, we will be in the next year or so having a sister masters in the Middle East and in Africa, and, and the Americas and so on. Um, so these are kind of cheap, high quality online programs, uh, training people in an MSc in sustainable development, but in partnership with the, with the SDG Academy, where we blend science policy and practice. Um, the first thing is uh, when this was a big year for sustainable development education, because we had what's called the UN General Assembly meeting on the TESS or the Transforming Education Summit. There was a pre-summit in Paris uh, in June before that. And there's a, a UNESCO themselves have a pathway to 2030, which is uh, which is really interesting. Um, but just say, well, one of the things is to, before we talk about sustainable development education, just where are we in education in general? And unfortunately, I mean, we can think of the MDGs in terms of what we call enrollment and completion rates, but the reality is uh, just we do have a big deficit in in education, no matter how we measure it. So just taking a more traditional view, like call it a STEM view of the world or a more economics view of the world before we look at sustainable development education. One thing that's becoming increasingly emphasized, and this is sustainable development goal uh, four, target two, is actually the kind of underestimated or uh, understated as preschool. Um, and of course, when you look at uh, the world in general, it uh, doesn't matter. We can actually see there is a problem in that preschool is not funded. It's not free. And the participation rates in early childhood or preschool is actually very poor. And there's more and more evidence out there that in a sense, the, the first few years of your life and, and even the preschool year is just so such a huge foundation for your ability to do well economically, politically, socially and every other way. Um, and the studies by Heckman and others that have actually traced people over time looking at kind of learning uh, or earning deficits and, and other lifelong deficits resulting from um, not having preschool. Um, this is a kind of a recent study. It's not easy to find, to, to measure quality in terms of why, what do you learn uh, in school? Because there's, you know, you can get enrollment rates, you can get completion rates, but what do you learn? But this is um, a recent study that's come out in the MBR um, by economists. And it's a very economics paper, but it focuses on STEM, like science, technology, education, maths. And it asked 15 year olds taking PISA scores, for example, um, have they come to an adequate standard? And it's, it's not a good reflection on the world. Like, so even in a place like the US, they're still up to 24% of 15 year olds who really do not have the basics in STEM. Uh, and, and of course this goes up to 80 or 90% depending where you are in the world. Uh, but there is extreme deficits. Like So even before, like we might want education for sustainable development. We want people in school to learn how to live with nature, to learn how to live with other people, not just teach them STEM skills, but also non-STEM skills, including empathy, things like working together, creativity, all these non-cognitive skills. Um, but the reality is, is even before we start in that journey of lifelong learning on sustainable development, we have to realize that even in the status quo of where we are, um, there's huge deficits in learning outcomes. Um, 
which, which have to be addressed. The, at the test summit, this is what you saw coming in the gate, uh, was this uh, learning poverty uh, study that was done. Um, and it just simply kind of, it did a study across the world on sampling uh, 10 year olds and asking them, could they actually read and understand a simple text or story? And the outcomes are not really good news. I know we had COVID, um, which was a problem, but uh, in terms of um, uh, learning, people were out of school for a few years, but even pre-COVID, you can actually see with high income to upper middle income, lower income, uh, low income countries that, you know, you have in low income countries up to 92% of 10 year olds not being able to comprehend or read a simple text. Um, and But even in high income countries, this is 14%. Um, so there's these, this is not a good um, outcome in terms of where we are, in terms of the content of what actually we actually are learning in school. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done, not only in terms of getting people enrolled, completed, but actually learning the STEM, but now we want them to learn more non-STEM or life skills uh, to do with, with sustainable development. So this is no easy task. Um, um, the, the one analysis that I, I won't spend too much time in here, sometimes like it is very well documented in a lot of economic studies that the private investment to schooling is not good. Um, that there is actually underinvestment in private. And this is because people look at lifelong lifelong learnings and lifelong investments, but there can be financial market reasons or uncertainty or lots of other reasons why you don't invest enough. And the same goes at government level. Why are governments not investing in, in education? And now we want them to invest in sustainable development. Education would be another level, but they certainly also underestimate, un underinvest. And this study that I showed you before actually does a nice analysis for, uh, in terms of if you would uh, actually, if everyone went to school and everyone had the right STEM skills, they actually estimate that in a present discount of values at the end of the century, that every country would get about 12% of GDP more economically for investing in education. So that's the economic return. But obviously you can get returns to society, uh, you know, no, less people on social protection, less crime, more healthy outcomes you can get returns from environment you know people managing air quality water quality and so on so that so that's a complete underestimate of the value to the economic dimension but also there's huge value to the governance and the social and um environment the the the, 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 the social environmental and governance level not just the economic level so a lot of economists economists would focus on you know, what percentage of your public spend is on education? And the thing, I guess, that's, you know, to be fair to the low income countries, um, they actually spend more of their of their public spend on education, as do the households in low income countries. The problem is, is that the revenue sources are weak and the tax base is weak. So this doesn't really um, amount to enough money to offer, for example, compulsory schooling and free university and things like this. OK, um, the same, you can actually do public edge spending as a percentage of GDP as well. But to, to put it um, simply in this, uh, what the UNESCO calls for in their framework in terms of finance, because so one button I want, so if we want to do um, education or sustainable development education, we need more finance and more money put into it. The recommendation at national level is that we should have up to 15 to 20 percent of public expenditure at least dedicated to education um so just to give you an example in ireland preschool is free primary is free secondary is free even the undergraduate is free even though there's elements of that that are, that are not free of course like because we have to go to we need accommodation we need books and, and other things um but it just shows you um, that, uh, the, that this requires a commitment on behalf of national governments of 15 to 20 percent. But those who have actually studied uh, low to low middle income countries say even committing 15 to 20 percent of your public spend actually does require some filling in by the global community. Um, and you might ask yourself, well, why should the world invest in, in education in other parts of the world? Well, you know, I think we see it, it's obvious in terms of the same development education. We have one ocean, one climate, one food system. 
Uh, we need peace. We need uh, to mitigate uh, climate refugees, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So even you know, apart from a moral duty, uh, there is um, a kind of a, a benevolent uh, or self-interest region, a self-interest to actually do this because um, in the best way for pathways to peace globally, the best ways for global economic development that is inclusive and environmentally secure is heavy investment into education. And obviously we'll talk about sustainable development education. But the moment they reckon the financing gap from the north to the south or the high income to low income is about 39 billion, I think that's probably um, a lot more. Um, but Gordon Brown at the test raised about 12 commitments for 12 billion a year, which is not 39 billion. Um, um, and then there are pushes now for ODA, overseas development aid and other sorts of finance, you know, to say, please focus on putting resources into sustainable development education or the education as a whole, because this is your best way of actually, this is the most important pathway to sustainable development. It's the best thing you can do um, to actually achieve sustainable development across the world. Um, just one thing I want to say is like, here are the goals and targets of SDG four, but I guess the things that I'm talking about, I want to talk about here that I think are really important is one is the government spending on education, whether it's, um, you know, whether it's uh, sustainable development education or not. And that actually comes from SDG one, um, target A in SDG one, which is basically talking about the proportion of uh, the total government spend on education. That's actually not an SDG four. And also the other thing that we want to stress is that we want to actually change the curriculum on um, to, you know uh, the nature of the curriculum towards sustainable development, you know, like global citizens education, education for sustainable development, and teacher education assessments, etc. And they're not actually mentioned in SDG four, but they are mentioned in other goals and targets of this agenda, which I've outlined here. So we the SDGs do give us a mandate to talk about finance, to talk about technology, to talk about curriculum, but they're not necessarily actually in in um, <coughs> SDG 4 itself, just to realize that. Um, and of course, before we start about sustainable development education, we have to realize that people's knowledge of environment and environmental science, it is, it is quite remarkable from why in preschool all the way from K-12, we might call it primary, secondary education into university, even into lifelong learning, people in important positions in corporates, important positions in government, important positions in NDOs, there is actually a huge deficit of sustainable development education. People do not know in their everyday activity or activities in the companies how they coexist with nature, how they coexist with humanity. They don't really know, um, even though they do understand they need air, good air quality, water and food and nutrition, they understand that. And they understand the need to live in a, in, a, in a respectful and peaceful environment where people respect each other's dignity. Everyone understands that. But the mechanisms and how that this is taught in school is not really there. Um, and this is just a little graph. We can go through some of the indicators on, um, let's call it sustainable development education, but it's, it's really not in the schools yet. And it is, you know, for humans not at a very young age to understand how they coexist with nature and with humanity uh, to understand the issues that give them basically daily life support and a quality of life is quite remarkable when we think about it. So there is a good body of work to be done to ensure <coughs> that we have lifelong learning in um, sustainable development education, but we're only at the beginning of the process. So the guiding in, <coughs> in the SG Academy, uh, we're working with the secretariat to a thing called Mission 4.7 that I encourage everyone to have a look at. It's a partnership between the Academy and um, UNESCO and the Ban Ki-moon Center uh, for Global Citizens and the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University and amongst many other partners, um, including the Pontifical Academy of Science and Social Science. Um, and this is just looking at target 4.7. And to me, this is about you know, when you're doing, have a plan for sustainable development education, you've got to think of the continuum from preschool all the way up to end of life, right? 
So you have to start think about reforming preschool, uh, introducing sustainable development education into K-12, but have that consistent with what you learn in the universities. But more importantly, now there's a big job of upskilling uh, and there's a big job to be done in terms of lifelong learning. So we also have to ensure that we kind of transform knowledge from the, what we call the top of the ladder and at the bottom of the ladder. And that continuum has to be there. And just like anyone coming into school says, I want to be a doctor, I want to be, uh, I want to be an engineer, I want to be a lawyer, we have to have that type of certainty and knowledge that I need to invest in my sustainable development education knowledge because that's the jobs of the future. I have to be future fit basically in my skills. And I know the types of jobs I would get as an engineer or as an economist or as a social worker, or as a teacher, and that would embed a huge amount of sustainable development education. Um, so that, that is a huge body of work to be done. Um, so I've, I've just explained that there. Um, universities, <coughs> you say, well, do universities have a role in this in Mission 4.7? Like, do we get involved? And the truth of the matter is, is that obviously as you know sdg knowledge if you want to call it curriculum data research intellectual property etc i mean that should be created in the universities uh, for dispersion everywhere into into upstream and downstream into schools into into all the the businesses etc and it is if you think about universities this is the place where there's intergenerational transfer and conversations and creating a creation of knowledge for everything but i wanted for sustainment development so when you say we want a dialogue between the youth and uh, the older generation this is exactly what happens inside universities um and of course universities traditionally had a professional role uh, that they should put obviously put more resources into which is to train teachers to, to create curriculums for schools which they do but they need to do it in a much more let's call it aggressive manner uh, when it comes to sustainable development because the need is now and it, there's a lot of uh, gaps that need to be filled very quickly and of course HGAs have their uh, uh, higher education institutes are involved in the upskilling of corporates through their business schools through public administrations for, through their politics of political science schools and we do an awful lot of science policy practice interfaces uh, with government departments and etc and um, so you'd have to say that uh we should not forget the role of universities and we should obviously ask them to think about the capacities they can build uh, between and across nations for lifelong learning and in particular to power up their professional pillars uh, for teacher and curriculum development and also for uh, training people in corporates and governments and so on uh, and there's this huge gap and need to create the actual curriculum and research and knowledge for all of this which does not exist really at the moment um, this is just to emphasize SDSN has six transformations that people are aware of, um, and education is, is the, the first one. And there is a body of work called the World in 2050, which is doing this sort of analysis for governments that if you invest in these six transformations, these are the types of returns you get economically, politically, uh, environmentally, and socially. Uh, and that there is a real good business model, if you like, for these investment sequences, which uh, create linkages across the world and feedback loops, which will ensure a safe operating space for all people and, and all countries in terms uh, for, for humanity, in terms of a, a safe operating space in, in, a, in a sustainable world. Um, but the thing we must, everyone agrees that the first step to all of this is education that we need to educate consumers or people at home, people you know, as, uh, as voters, that they have to want sustainable development pathways. And then of course, when they want that, uh, companies will have to do it as well. And people in governments will have to have the policies and, and et cetera. So uh, we cannot underestimate how important education is for this project. But yet, as I showed you before, the investment into education are just remarkably low. And, uh, uh, and this is very problematic. And apart from, you know, just teaching people the science of all of, of all of this or teaching them the sort of moral and ethics of all of this, uh, what we do need to do, if we're using technology to be the great transformer in terms of getting us to scale and to redo all our curriculum and the way we're thinking and reskilling everyone, um, that, so technology is a great promise, but, we have to have individuals who use this knowledge 
and create the technology for sustainable development and the systems and the, the you know, even uh, the, what we heard in the previous talk about having people inside companies who can revisit their accountancy skills, update their accountancy skills to bring in sustainability criteria and indicators and monitoring and audits. This is just a huge amount of very fast transition to different types of skills. Um, and of course, the World Economic Forum has said, well, for the 21st century, we, we really, from preschool upwards, we've got to think of problem solving, people to be able to network, manage themselves, drive themselves, network, use technology and development. And this is not in our skills uh, skill set of, 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 of children and adults in general either. Uh, so it's it's really not just about, it's the skill sets for sustainable development education, and particularly if we're going to drive it with technology, because uh, this is our only hope to get everyone upskilled and everyone uh, reskilled in the adult population, but also to reform curriculum in K-12 uh, below. And in this respect, um, I'm going to finish soon. Um, I, I've also in the slide showed you from the GA test, the six calls to action. And so they were very much, there's two big initiatives. One is the financial facility, which I talked about, Gordon Brown, but if there's such deficits there, there has to be a lot more money and finance for this type of project happening, but we support obviously any initiative like that. And then the other initiative was the public learning platforms, uh, which I wanna talk about in a sec, just to say the promise of technology or digital learning in terms of this mission 4.7 that I talked about. Um, and of course, this has all been led up to 2030 and beyond by a high level steering committee in UNESCO. So you can have a, a look at who's on that and what their work plans are and so on. Um, so these are the six action plans. I just want to zone in. I've talked about financing, just zone in on digital learning. And these were the, the three keys and six. So there was, there was three key actions, cont content, capacity, connectivity, and six commitments. But the one that we focused on in the academy uh, was this UNESCO recommendation on open education resources, which I'd encourage everyone to look at. So all governments of the world have actually signed in, in, in November 2019 uh, this instrument called the UNESCO recommendation on OER and open education resources. And this is actually as close a thing to a legal instrument as you can get uh, working with UNESCO. And all governments have basically said, we want um, all education resources to be free and open uh, at all levels of schooling and university and lifelong learning. It's a key requirement to actually implement the SDG project. And, and people have been thinking about that. Our contribution, starting with the SDI forum, we put together a team uh, just to think about how we could get open access resources created easier, how they can be put in repositories, how they can be metadated, uh, open license put on them, how they could be distributed much easier across uh, across countries. And the thing we came up with was actually working with libraries and particularly the UN library system because every country in the world has a, a, has a, has a library with a, an education, what's called a, an OER or a repository and it's very advanced technology, which can host collections very easy. And that's what librarians do. They can catalog, they can have sustainable resources, they can metadata, et cetera, and protect property rights. Um, but we were thinking that this is the digital highway that we should be using to create OER, to push it around the world, have it easily updated, repurposed, translated, and so on. So we started this idea at the Science Technology Innovation Forum. Um, and we also presented it at the UNESCO, in the UNESCO Transforming Education Pre-Summit. And finally, we presented it on Solutions Day uh, in, in September 17th, uh, which was kindly sponsored by uh, the, uh, the government of Ghana and Ireland, but also by the, by the UN Academic Impact and UNESCO, or, uh, UNESCO as well. Um, but the mission of this idea here is how, and you'll see it coming in the future, how we're going to operationalize this idea of creating open access resources. Uh, but it's one thing creating them, it's another thing protecting them with intellectual property, having them uh, de 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 disseminated and distributed all across the world through libraries, easily accessible, easily updated, translatable. And we just think that has to be there as a necessary condition 
uh, for us to undertake transforming education in schools, in universities, and in the business and government and NGO environments. If we don't have that content and it's uh, high quality, uh, a good content, um, uh, we cannot really go on this journey of transforming education. So we think this is very necessary. Um, so this is the team in the SDG Academy. Uh, this is our donors. Uh, this is our, uh, you can take a snap of our, of our handles there just on our social media and uh, feel free to contact us and I'll uh, stop sharing now and I'll take any questions. Um, thank you, um, Professor Walsh, for that wonderful presentation. Um, the question I have, uh, which I'm, we're going to project on the screen, was from the, um, someone from the audience. And the question I'll read, it says, are there laid down budgetary provisions benchmarked by the United Nations that countries should follow for sustainable development? And are there sanctions for deviance by yeah. member countries? Yeah. Yeah. So as you, as as everyone knows, um, you know the Paris Agreement obviously is legally binding, um, and people like if you live in Europe, etc., like the, it is like so. For example, uh, when the Irish government had a mitigation plan for its car pathways to carbon emissions, um, the civil society or uh, academics on behalf of civil society solicitors took the Irish government to court to say that they're not meeting their uh, targets and their objectives and pathways uh, and that we're actually going to have to pay uh, and, uh, you know compensation to, to Europe and, and others for not achieving them so like Paris is a is has a legal framework and ha and potentially you can be sanctioned that's what I'm trying to get to when it comes to the SDGs uh, the, the best that we could do was this thing called the voluntary national reviews um, now, it's still a powerful instrument because academics have lived in this world where we have peer review, you know, uh, and it's it's not an easy process. So every country, every four years has to come to the UN and present its uh, progress on the SDGs, including obviously education and SDG four. Um, but it's voluntary. Um, and, and, and of course, you could be in a sense name and shamed or you want to present your country in, a, in its best light. But it's certainly not a, a legal commitment, right? So at the moment, you know, the work of um, UNESCO and others are guidelines. Like they're just saying, uh, guys, if you if you want to have compulsory education up to, to secondary school and resource it, uh, if you want to avoid have economic growth and and a good social, political, and economic environmental future for your country, I mean, it's so obvious to invest in education, and it's actually one of the cheaper things to do, like compared to a health system. Or, or other things. And of course, what I've just outlined now is the guidelines to getting maybe spending up to the public spend up to 20%. But even then, we have to encourage philanthropy and ODA, Overseas Development Aid, to actually have a much bigger proportion of their budget to help support the low and the lowest income countries to meet uh, the, the level of spend on education uh, as possible. Um, but, and, and of course, you know, Governments should be thinking about putting money into resources like the technology that's there to create content, to distribute content, and and so on. Um, so, you know, this is guidelines. Okay, so what can actually make this a reality? Well, you know, the key thing is one type of work that's been done by the generous is called the SDG stimulus, which is saying, look, you take our saving funds and our pension funds, these are to the, to the, to the multilateral banks and equity funds and, and, and so on, um, taxpayers' money to the to intergovernmental banks, people's money to, to equity funds and asset funds, et cetera. And, and we have to create a pathway to say, you know, you will get a decent rate, rate of return, you will we'll under, we'll mitigate risk, but we've got to get money into uh, building capacity at government levels, you know, so a lot of countries can't even borrow at a good interest rate on the bond markets. They can't get access to this money, right? So I think finance uh, and, and, and understanding both private and public finance and somehow thinking it from a global perspective and like the way we maybe did with HIV AIDS money, uh, we've just got to do that for education. So it's a very good question that, you know, we'd love to be able to put in, you know, requirements for governments to hit these levels, 
uh, of spending and to somehow audit them and, and I don't know, make them accountable in some ways. But that's not what the UN is. It's not what it's, it's a members club where the institutions give you a guideline. They try to make the argument. They try to work together and, and facilitate the flow of money. Um, but it's just not we're, we're, it's just not the framework. Right. But I think the more that people understand uh, that's education, the more the people in government and people for state and development advocates, et cetera, understand the importance of finance. So to kind of not just to say we want sustainment of edu same development education, but to have a look at what the government is spending on education, where they're spending it, what they're spending it on, and to put them under pressure in terms of what I call the means or the levers of achieving sustainable development. Um, and civil society can do that. And everyone can, even in universities, we can start to ask these type of questions about um, the scale and the nature of investment and, and what, what's its target. But I think the best, the best thing uh, for me at the academy and where I really want progress, uh, and it's kind of not in the rankings of universities, uh, the criteria for ranking universities that universities have to one, create SDG material, make it open science uh, and, and, and open source. Uh, two, they have to distribute this material and help build cap capacities in universities across the world and uh, not to compete with them but actually to work with them and then finally to be very open to uh, increasing their professional pillars the training of teachers the training of people in corporates and governments and civil society that has to be cheap maybe uh, high quality courses for people to upskill quickly uh, so they can do all the sorts of things that they might want to do inside companies and governments, et cetera, right? So this is an emergency, but I just feel that nothing can be done unless we take the education thing very seriously, right? To invest in it, get the content right, and then work together to actually disperse it uh, uh, across the world uh, and disperse it into entities that, that we want to actually transform the world to, for, for the future we want, as we call it. But it's a very good question. So there's no sanctions, there's no criteria, but there's moral duties. All right, thank you. Um, another question um, from the audience is, um, do you collaborate with academics to provide content or create courses with SDG Academy? If so, um, what, what is the process for that? Well, first step is just to contact us. So we have a so we have a at the moment i call it is a bit of a top down process where um you know we're aware the academics who and what we like to do is have academics who are working obviously on the science of all the sdgs um who are connected to policy folks who are connected to un folks and all our courses have this kind of science policy um practice interface and in a sense, we have an academic committee that reviews them and we have to then get them resourced and then we actually get them published, et cetera, right? So the thing though, just to answer the question, and of course, anyone out there who's an academic who'd like to do an SG Academy, come with us and we'll partner you and, and we'll actually create that sort of framework, right? Um, but the, to, to answer you, why we're doing this work with UNESCO and UN Library and all the other partners, the UN Academic Impact, is that we'd love to have a more organic system where people on their learning management system, let's say an academic has a good course, show them how to package that in a repository, put an open license on it, show them how to collapse it to a, a thing called Scrum, uh, bring it to us, and then we can work with you and edX to actually get it up as a, as a free online course that can be distributed across the world and everyone else, right? But we need to, ourselves to put in that sort of a technical uh, th that technology structure, which we're actually doing. Um, it will take us a year or so to get it up and running. Um, but the answer to you is there's an academic there that would like to have their course on SG Academy, just email me. Okay, great. Um, can you tell us the email address for the sake of the audience? Yeah, paul.walsh at unssdsn.org. So paul.walsh at unsdsn.org. But if you, Patrick Paul Walsh is quite a unique name. You, if you type my name into Google, it'll probably pop up. You'll get an email very quickly. Uh, thank you. So another question we have is, how can we consider cultural issues? So, hmm. 
together with sustainability yeah. for an inclusive perspective. Because you, in your presentation, you talked about um, the um, poor um, societies and even rich or developing societies. Yeah. So how can we put in um, cultural perspective? In yeah. That? So this is, um, you know, avoiding colonialism again, you know, true technology. I, I understand the question very well. And obviously, we all are aware inside our companies, inside our cities, inside our own universities and, and where we are, our context is different. You know, that how nature and how we interact with humanity is actually fundamentally different depending where we are in the world, right? So um, there is no doubt that there's a context and a cultural issue here, right? Even language, let's say, is, is a big issue, right? Um, but what we feel is that that's why if you actually can share Edu open education resources in a way that they're updatable and translatable, that, uh, that smart academics and, and smart people in government departments, you know, can involve, you know, indigenous knowledge and, and others to actually create, to actually update, translate, repurpose the knowledge so that it's appropriate for the context, right? And, and this is not just a big, this is not just in an education material that we have that problem. Uh, the, the, I mentioned the Science Technology Innovation Forum has a lovely platform called 2030 Connect, which has a lot of patents and, and technologies and everything that can be used or taken, and you can try to apply them in your, in your country or local context. But this is the problem, is that they invariably have to be, there has to be a local capacity, and then a people who are able to bring that local context and cultural context into the materials, right? So this is a this is tough then in, in that uh, you can say, yes, it's nice to have education resources and access to all of these, and it could help us. It's a good starting point. But every country then has to have the capacities uh, and the resources then to update, repurpose, translate, and put in their cultural and local context. So this is a big job. But to kind of recognize that, though, right, to recognize that, you know, when you create OER or open education resources, that you put in a Creative Commons license and you know that people that you allow people to take the components that they want to update and to create the knowledge they need for their own local and cultural context. And um, so this is um, this is definitely uh, it, it's there in the UNESCO. That's why you should read the UNESCO recommendation on OER because these things are, are are very, very well detailed there. And I know you can say, God, these are good principles, but they're hard to do. But everything that's great and everything that's uh, perfect on this earth, uh, you know, and it is difficult to do. Um, but that should not discourage us. Once we know this is what we have to do in terms of OER and to embed cultural and local context and to make sure that anything that's deliverable uh, cannot have what's called curved technology. A technology that doesn't allow you to translate or to update or that you have to pay money for or um, that you actually have to use the, the sort of cultural context that it's very important uh, that that OER, o open education resources are updatable, repurposed, repurpose, easily repurposed, easily translated, and you can add in the local knowledge and the local context and, and cultural considerations. So that's a, a brilliant question and it should be emphasized. So thank you for that. So the question There's a is, question by Eva. Do you want me to answer the question by Ivan? By yes, Ivan? It's just, yeah. yes. It's Ivan said, what inspired you to join the SDG Academy? Yeah. Okay, so uh, there's never a short story to this. Um, so, so basically, I've been working with Jeffrey Sachs uh, since 2007. And, um, you know, he at the time was, uh, he's, he was special advisor to, to Kofi Annan, I think, at the time. Uh, then he went to be special advisor with Ban Ki Moon and now um, Antonio Guterres. But um, one of the things that Sachs, just to tell you, Sachs used to do was that when he was doing the MDG project, he had a class in Columbia University in SIPA, the School of International Political Affairs. And whether by accident or design or whether he was busy in the UN, he just felt that the students would enjoy 
you know, lectures from, you know, people visiting New York, whether they're visiting. So they had leaders of countries, you know, people, you know, leaders in the UN coming into the classroom to discuss the issues of development or the MDGs at the time. And of course, that's electrifying to actually have that sort of mixture of science, policy and practice in the classroom. But when they were doing the MDG project, and at the time he was thinking of the millennium uh, villages, if people are aware of those, they were, they were doing work across Africa and other countries. Um, they felt education was important and he wanted to broadcast out the classroom, as he calls it, his classroom to other schools. And that's where I got to know him because at the time we were using Adobe and phone lines and we had 40 universities around the world coming into his classroom and we were all discussing obviously the MDGs at the time. But that was the beginning of this idea that, you know, this is the birth of the SDG Academy, basically, you know, that we should really be, uh, and that's why we have our global classroom in, in the SDG Academy. If you want to have a look at that, we still do that on, on introductions to STEM development. It's open to everyone. It's free to everyone. You can, and uh, 38 schools are credited in their, in their courses. Um, but we're, that's why we're doing the MSc online. Uh, where it brings staff from different universities across the world to teach together, bring the science and or bring the practice policy folks in, get people doing their capstones and projects, right? So, so basically the beginnings of this was working with Jeff on the, the global classroom. Uh, that then translated, I was on the board of SDSN when it was created. Um, I was always on the oversight committee of the SG Academy. But why now? Um, I guess during COVID, I just said, I want to, everyone is resetting. I just felt that I, I've, I'm delighted to teach in UCD and all the great students, but I just think in terms of this mandate to try and get um, resources and sustainable development education going, I've gone on secondment for five years with SDG Academy, um, just to, um, to uh, hopefully take all of this to another level and scale. Um, you know, because that's what we need in the world at the moment, right? Because like, we'll, everyone will turn around with the climate emergency and say, okay, you're right, we have to do something. The companies will turn around, the governments will turn around, the society, you, even universities, and then they'll go, where's the content? Like, how do we do this? How do we train people? Um, so we need to be working on this uh, very aggressively. Um, but that's my story. Um, so it was kind of a more gradual, uh, but uh, but I've, I am full time now on the SDG Academy for the next five years, at least. Wow, I think it's very inspiring. Um, we have another question from Robert Lester. It said, Professor Walsh, three words when you think about sustainability. Uh, um, well, look, I'm taking this as, as the previous professor did, the, the Brutland definition, right? So we're thinking of sustainability in terms of livelihoods and society and governance, and we're thinking of uh, in society. So for society, look, kindness. Um, for governance, peace. People have to not not allow themselves uh, get involved, like to be a, a be, to be an advocate of of peace and negotiation and and uh, uh, et cetera. Um, a prosperity, and I know that's, uh, and then I'm missing one, and of course, the you know, th this idea of looking after nature like we, most of our religions will teach us that we don't own nature, in fact, we're supposed to be somebody who looks after the, 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 the planet and creates it and, and gives it in the best condition we can to future generations. So, I think the the, the, these kind of words are the key words that are behind the, the SDG agenda. Um, so hopefully that's, hope that's okay. Good, Robert, that's a tough question. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, um, Professor Walsh, for taking time out um, to be here today. Um, we really enjoyed the presentation and we hope that um, you will collaborate with us um, in the future. Um, thank you. And do you have any last words for the audience? No, um, it's a, again, please contact us if you want to get involved with the SG Academy. Um, and particularly if you're in companies or governments or whatever, and you want to get going on training, because this is what we're starting to do now. Um, but so we're, we're very happy to, to do that. And we're also delighted to work with the Green Institute. Um, we're, we're, uh, you're part of SDSN anyway, so I'm yes. always delighted to work with you. 
<laughs> All right, thank you, yeah. Sir Osh, and um, so, um, yeah, so have a good day, and um, lovely being here, having you here today. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.